have a seat. So as I was saying, <laughs> we're just starting a, a, a new series here on, on the Why series, and I want to talk this morning about why connect groups. Why is that such an important part of the church? Why is it that we should be a part of one, or we should, maybe God is calling you to run one? But what is it that makes them such an important part or an important element uh, of the church? You know, the first and foremost thing we need to remember is that the church is a family. You know, these are your, look around, these are your brothers and sisters in Christ. And, uh, you know, sometimes our biological families, uh, for whatever reason, may not be able to be a part of our lives. And, uh, you know, I know for mine, most of mine are over on the East Coast and uh, it's wonderful to catch up with them when I do. But really, I, for my brothers and sisters, for every day, support and, and, you know, counsel and mentoring and all that is right here within the church, within the body of Christ. And so it's a really important aspect that we understand how that works because... I don't know about you, but when you come to church, it's like, hi, how are you? Yep, great. How was your week? Yep, not too bad. And that's kind of it, isn't it? It's hard in this environment to really sort of go that next level and to unpack it. And so I want to sort of look at some deeper reasons as to why the, the value of connect groups or what the value is and why we would do them. But let's have a look at Acts 5 verse 42, if I can, please. Aidan, it says, daily in the temple and in every house, they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. So this is when the, new, the, the, the early church was starting. That was how they were getting the word out, was in the homes. That was how they took the gospel, was from house to house. And they were spending time learning about Jesus Christ. And that's still a very powerful way to do it. But I want to go back and just you know, look at things right from the beginning. That you know, I want to establish this fact that from the beginning, God is a family. And, and he was, his whole intention the whole time was to build that family, to add to that family. So if we go back to the, or we go to the first slide, please. Thank you. It says, the beginning was family, and the first point, of course, was the triune God. You know, I talked a couple of weeks ago about the Trinity, the importance of the Trinity, and, and how that impacts on our lives and how we work with the Trinity. But, you know, so they were a unit right from the very beginning. And now who here has ever sat and thought, well, where did you come from, God? Have you ever tried to go down that track? It kind of messes with your head a little bit, doesn't it? Well, who created you, God? And how long have you been there for? You know, it, it, it can really sort of send you a little bit funny in the head when you try to sort of unpack that. But God has been there forever. But at some point, I mean, one thing we need to understand is time is only uh, current in our world because of human beings. So in the supernatural, there is no time. Right? There, there just is no time. So we don't probably, you know, when you get to heaven and you get to say to God, well, how long have you lived for? Well, he's probably not going to be able to really give you a, an answer other than try and put it in human terms. But we understand he's always existed and that, that was the three of them. And their heart was to expand. But if we have a look at Matthew 28, verse 19, from when Jesus released us to preach the, the gospel and making disciples, he says, baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. So what happens is when you are baptised, you are baptised into a family. You're baptised into the family of God. And it's not just, it starts with the triune God, but then it expands. And that's the next point I want to look at, is that after God had, uh, you know, he was there, he then established angels. He created angels. And we don't know exactly how many, we know there's tens of thousands of them. And, uh, you know, if we, we read the Bible, you'll, you'll get the bit of the history of what happened there, of course, that a, a third of the angels uh, were taken by Satan and uh, they were cast to earth. So that means there's two thirds of the angels that are still around working with us and working for God. And so Psalm 103.20 gives us a little bit of insight as to what the role of angels was. It says, bless the Lord, you, his angels, who excel in strength, who do his word, heeding the voice of his word. And again, we don't know exactly how long angels were around before uh, God created human beings. But it must have been part of the plan of God because he does say that angels are our ministering spirits, that they are there to guide us and to help us and protect us and all of those things. Uh, in fact, towards the end of this year, Pastor Reg in the School of Impartation, for the very first time in 10 years, is going to be teaching on the roles of angels in our lives. And uh, I really encourage you to be able to come along and listen to that because we get a lot of teaching, particularly in the Pentecostal, about the demonic, don't we? 
but we don't always get to hear about, well, that's only one third. What about the other two thirds? And, uh, you know, as we'll look in this other scripture, part of the reason the church has been a little bit reluctant to kind of highlight angels is because we want to make sure we do keep it in perspective. As John says here, he heard these things, and when he heard and saw, he fell down to worship before the feet of the angel who showed me these things. But the angel said, See that you do not do that, for I am your fellow servant and of, and of your brethren, the prophets. So he calls out the prophets, our brothers, uh, the, the ones that had gone before us. And he's saying, And of those who keep the words of this book, so all of us who keep the words of this book, the Bible, Revelation, it's saying that those angels, he, he's work, walking alongside us. You know, they're not above us, they're not below us, they, they walk alongside us. And so we don't worship angels, and they will always point you back to God. They will say, worship God. So that is their role, to, to point us back to God and ensure that we aren't overly emphasising the angelic in our life in that way and giving them due that we should be giving to God. And that's what happens in the New Age. Excuse me. They'll, they start to pick up, you know, that my guardian angel's doing this and my guardian angel's doing that. And, you know, there's nothing wrong with acknowledging that an angel is, is doing ministry. I think I've shared with you guys before that when I was going through my cancer journey and Pastor Red shared with me one time that when I was preaching and it was before I, I'd gone for my operation and, you know, I, I was in a little bit of pain because the, the cancer was growing and, you know, but I was scheduled to try and, trying to get things done and, uh, I think at one point too, we, you know, I, I had a, a, a mentor in my life say, look, can you give me two more weeks before you go for your operation? I want to see if God will come through and, and, and bring that healing. And, you know, I really wrestled with that, to be honest, uh, because I was starting to feel a little bit of pain. And, and as I said, I could feel the, the cancer growing. And uh, anyway, so to cut a bit of a long story short, Later on that day when I was, I was preaching, and I often felt okay while I was preaching, quite amazing. But, you know, Pastor Reg said to me, there were two angels up on stage with you ministering and, and bringing a, a healing and, and working on your, your tummy area. So, and we know there's 24 angels in here right now. Some may see them, some may, a lot of, most of us don't though. But, you know, they are present and they are a part of what we get to do and walk through as Christians today. <clears throat> But they were the next part of the family that God had intended for us to have. And so the next point, though, of course, is that he then created humans. All right? So, you know, God is now expanding his family. He's got the angels. He's now saying, I'm going to create humans. And as Genesis 1.26 says, he says, I'm going to make man in our image, according to our likeness. So that's why we understand when we read the Bible, we understand there's a, you know, God has a face and hands and, and he'll reference those things. He has ears and, and eyes and, and he'll use all of that. So we know we're made in the image of who he, and what he is and that God was getting ready to expand his family through uh, human beings. And that's why he says, you know, um, oh, actually it wasn't in that bit, was it? Sorry. Then the next point, after he sort of said to us, well, this is what you get, to, that I'm creating humans, he then says to them, now I want you to go forth and multiply. In Genesis 1:28, God blessed them, Adam and Eve, and said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And so that was a mandate given to human beings. And again, he's saying, I want to grow my family. And I'm going to move that out. And I was sharing last night with the guys, the service last night, about a story about uh, Pastor Karen. And I think I have shared with it with, um, previously, maybe, that when uh, her and I landed in Perth the same month, uh, in April 2001, so we've been here 18 years now, can you believe that? Gosh, next month. And uh, she was a new Christian. And I'd known God most of my life, but she was a pretty well brand new Christian. And uh, I remember going over to her house one day and we were sitting outside. It was in, she was uh, living in a unit in Subiaco at the time and uh, she had the doors open and it was a beautiful summer evening. But I'm thinking, what are you doing? You're going to let the flies in? You're going to let the mozzies in? What is going on here? You know, because I grew up in a home was, shut that door, you're letting the flies in. And, and I'm still a bit like that, aren't I, babe? Sorry about that, my, <laughs> my poor husband. You know, I... I just I'm like so sort of like conscientious about keeping our screen doors closed. Anyway, she just says to me, well, 
I've been given dominion over everything, so I told them they're not allowed to come past the threshold. They have to stay outside. I was like, wow, that's impressive. Here I am, you know, 30-year-old Christian, and you're brand new, you've got more faith than I do. And so, you know, and I love that. I love the fact that she took these sort of scriptures literally and was saying, I, I have, you know, dominion over every creepy crawly, everything that flies and carries on. So a few of you can try that tonight, hey, at your house. Let me know how you go. <laughs> But God wanted to establish families. He's saying, be fruitful, multiply. And if some of you hadn't followed that mandate or your parents hadn't followed that mandate, you wouldn't be sitting here today, would you? So this was a way God was going to expand his kingdom. And the scripture in Malachi is a very interesting one where it says, you know, he's talking about husbands and wives here. He's saying, God, did he not make them one? He has, and having a remnant of the spirit. And why one? Because he seeks godly offspring. So this was always God's intention to create marriage and the family to populate the kingdom of God. That's where his heart is at. And that is why we are encouraged and, and exhorted to have children. You know, a lot of uh, Australian, Australians, in particular, white Caucasian Australians, are withholding having children. And, you know, that's not necessarily a good thing. Um, I mean, you know, I wasn't able to have children. If I'd been able to, I would have. I would have loved to have done that. But for those who are making a conscious choice, you know, that's not necessarily what it was that God intended, that his heart is to see people populate this earth and to have the godly offspring because his heart is to have as many in his kingdom as possible by the time Jesus returns because this is, you know, not a forever thing, is it, that we're going to be able to procreate because angels can't procreate. And, uh, well, certainly not between themselves. It's only something given to the human being. And so that's, a, you know, it's something that God is, is asking us to do because he desires that godly offspring. And, he's, and you know, there's a little bit of a, a warning there that goes with that, but I'm going to talk about that in a few weeks in another topic. So God has established, he's created humans, he's established families, uh, but now he also says, well, I've got a lot of people here that I now need to, to manage and corral. So in the Old Testament, what God did was he kind of established systems within communities. He established hierarchies. And if we have a look at Deuteronomy 1 verse 15, it says, I took the heads of your tribes, wise and knowledgeable men, and made them heads over you, leaders of thousands, leaders of hundreds, leaders of fifties, leaders of ten, and officers for your tribes. You know, God is a God of order. And it's interesting, isn't it, that even though God established that in the Old Testament, we see that in corporations, don't we? We see managers, you know, who are over, one is over a thousand, one is over a hundred, one is over ten, etc. And I think some uh, uh, translations call it captains, captains over thousands and over hundreds and fifties, etc. So, you know, so God was wanting to ensure then that we ran in a way that was going to, you know, create order and that there was accountability in how we did things. And if you've ever been a manager over people, managing people is not easy, is it? You know, it's, uh, it's not, it's, it can be a challenging task. But God equips us to do whatever we can to be able to bring that in place uh, to ensure that the family of God, the way that the communities and systems work, will be accountable and have honour there and walk in the way that they should. But out of that then, obviously, was the, it, God was his, peop- it was his people in the Old Testament, But then in the New Testament came the church. And so this was the new vehicle in which God was going to operate through. And I know some people, you know, say, well, should we have home churches? I don't agree with mega churches. I don't agree with this. I don't agree with that. Well, look, guys, at the end of the day, you know, we get keep getting prophesied over us that we're just going to get bigger and bigger. And maybe that will or or, uh, is, is or isn't the right thing. I don't know from a doctrinal point of view. All I know is we need to follow Holy Spirit. And so we just need to be on track with him. And so if another church says we're shutting down, God said to go into the homes, okay, I'm not going to argue with that. We just need to follow what it is, the the directive is that God has given any particular church. But the, the reality is that he did establish the church. And the church needs to stay until Jesus returns because he's coming back to what? Marry his bride, the church. So Matthew 16, verse 18, we start with that. It says, I say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. So 
So that's a pretty strong comment, isn't it? Now, for all the, little, the theologians in the, in the room, I just want to talk briefly about this scripture because some have interpreted this as being Peter is the one in which the church was to be built on. Well, I just want to encourage you, check out your, thesaur- your, your concordances, check out the, the Greek and all of those wording and things. It actually is Jesus telling, telling them he is the rock in which the church will be built on, not Peter. So I just want to let you know that because I think sometimes there's a little bit of misunderstanding about that. And as far as we know, the commentaries will all agree that it is, he's talking about Jesus is the, is the rock. And you can look at some other scriptures. Again, for the theologians, have a look at 1 Corinthians 10 verse 4. And that will also speak to that situation. So Jesus is building his church on himself. And in fact, uh, another scripture says he's the chief cornerstone, doesn't it? But the other one I want to look at here is Colossians 1.18. It says that Jesus is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. And so, guys, at the end of the day, Jesus is the head of this church, and we follow what he tells us to do and how to do it. You know, from time to time, we, we talk about the fact that this church has been set up with a, as a theocracy, not a democracy. And that, you know, we issued a paper, I think about a year and a half or two years ago, to just speak to the way that God has told us to set up the apostolic prophetic model. And that it wasn't to be, you know, with a board and and that sort of corporate structure, but that God wanted it to remain the theocracy where he was running it. Because what can happen is a little bit like the Israelites, right, when they rejected God and said, we want a king. And that's what the modern day church has done to a certain extent. Where it said, well, we want someone in-house. We want a CEO running the show. And we want a board. And, uh, you know, a lot of churches, I realise, run that model. And if God tells us to change, we will change it. But at this point, this is how God is, and he's explained it. One, if you'd like to get access to that document, I'm very happy to to share that with you. Because it was just an internal document for the church here in this community. Uh, it wasn't something we wanted to publish necessarily, but certainly we wanted to help people understand because from time to time people will say, why don't you have a board and, and uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, the way you run it or set it up. So if you'd like to know more, happy to chat with you about that. But it, where are we heading with all this? So God's established a family. God has established the church. And now he's also part of the corporate church is also to look at the small groups that, that make up the church. Because small groups kind of naturally happen in a church anyway, don't they? You know, older people may connect with older people, younger people with younger people, et cetera, et cetera. So God, but God works through small groups in a very powerful way. Let's have a look at the first point I want to make here with Jesus. You know, he chose 12 disciples. That really is a small group, isn't it? And so he had 12 disciples that he worked with for three and a half years, ministering to them, teaching them, completely, you know, filling them with understanding and and releasing them into their calling. You've got the 72 that that Jesus said, you know, go two by two out in in my name and uh, preach the gospel and and get the word out there. And they all came back really excited saying, oh, far out, Jesus, even the demons leave in your name. You know, so they they really saw some some great things happening in their world. And and God, God moved powerfully through those 72 the upper room, all right? You know, again, an amazing place where a lot of prayer took place. And it was the, that was the place that uh, Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost. And so I don't know about you, but, you know, being in those small groups or, or being in, in that sort of situation, that, that can be a pretty exciting place, can't it? And uh, God has started, I'm going to get to this, but God has, has said that this is a, a place he wants to start moving through in this church. And, of course, in homes, uh, again, we saw right at the beginning that they, they preached from house to house. But here in Acts 2 verse 42, as the church was getting up and running, it says they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. So here's this small group gathering that's the, the beginning of the church and God is moving powerfully through that. And so all who believed were together, had all things in common, sold their possessions and goods. Don't worry, guys, we're not going to ask you to do that. And divided them among all as anyone had need. And so continuing daily with one accord in the temple, breaking bread from house to house, 
They ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favour with all the people. You know, each week we send a mess, a, 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 an email out saying, this is the suburb we're praying for this week, guys. And I hope many of you are, are getting that and are putting that on your prayer list. And, you know, God is saying, I want to move in that suburb to do this. I want to move in that suburb to do that. And he wants to ignite something. And, you know, most of us would come from a good portion of suburbs around Perth. And so you and I are a light in that suburb. You and I are making a difference in that suburb. And it only takes, you know, well, two or more, as we'll see, uh, to be gathered that we can see that happening. So God moves through you know, in the homes and in the small groups that are starting and are naturally occurring in the church. The point I want to look at here, though, is that the people, the human beings, are really the primary way in which people learn about Jesus. I know from time to time there might be exceptions, particularly in the Middle East, where Jesus has appeared to people, you know, and they've given their heart, but primarily, particularly in the Western world, you know, we have the ability, we have the, the resources to preach the gospel. And so that's how God, God primarily uses us. Or you, when you walk into your workplace, or as some of you guys do, going down the beach. I know you do that and you, you're very good at evangelizing. Some of you have a real gift in being able to evangelize to people uh, without even have, knowing them very well. And I know people have come into the church through that way, into, into a relationship with Jesus. But, you know, also the prophetic words, they come via a human being, don't they? The words that you speak, the words you've heard from other people. And so we want to create an environment, or God is saying, create an environment where this can happen more and more, that it's not just relying on the church meeting once a week or twice a week and hoping people will come into the church. You know, at some point, guys, we've got to kind of go out there and be in your home and, and inviting those that are around you, your work colleagues, your, your um, neighbours, people like that, and allow God to really start to make a difference in that area. But let's have a look at Romans 10, 14, where it simply says, How shall people basically call on him, Jesus, in whom they have not believed? But how shall they believe in him if they've not heard about him? And how do they hear without a preacher? And so, guys, it's not just about the corporate preaching here, standing behind a pulpit. All of us have the ability to preach the gospel. All of us have ability to, to tell someone about the good news of Jesus Christ and their salvation and him coming again. And so that it, it is by that hearing that people will hear, that will, will know. And Acts 22, it says, um, this is Ananias releasing a prophetic word over Paul, the Apostle Paul, who was Saul at this time. He says, you will be his witness to all men of what you have seen and heard. And now, why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. So even though Saul had had that amazing moment on the road to Damascus that Jesus appeared to him, Jesus then finished the work by saying, Ananias, you now need to go, lay hands on Paul, let him be able to see again, and you know, release the word for him, tell him what I've got planned for him. And so you know, there was human beings generally nearly always in the mix. In fact, God says... Well, I won't do anything on earth unless I tell my prophets first. And some people totally disregard the prophetic word. Well, they can, that's no problem, but I'd say it's to their peril, to be honest. You know, so that's why we honour the prophetic word, because God himself says that's how I release what is coming and what's going to happen in certain situations. So human beings have a very important part in this whole process. And, you know... We are the ones who provide the ongoing discipleship and encouragement of people. Matthew 16, 24, Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. And so when you and I start to walk alongside people who are, you know, Christianity is new to, they're new believers, they're still unpacking this, this is one of the key messages that you and I are helping people understand that you've got to start to learn how to put aside your, your own wants and desires and deny those things, take up your cross and follow Jesus. And so that's the message that we are working with people who are, are getting to know who and what Jesus is. And that's part of that discipleship. But we're also here to encourage people. Hebrews 3 verse 13. Exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. So there's a level of exhortation that happens amongst us. 
It's not to, you know, go and tell anybody off or to judge anybody, but it's just to say, hey, you know, we're here to, to work out what is it God wants us to do. How do we line up what we're about to do with what God says we're about to do? And so there's an exhortation there, an exhortation to, to rise up and be all that God is asking us to be and to not do things in, in a way that would not be pleasing to him. You know, it's uh, so amazing in the last few weeks uh, at our, in our Connect group, we've been deliberately doing a, a particular course and, uh, you know, it's it's put us in a situation where we, we have a, a, some sharing time with the women and with the men. And uh, I have so appreciated that opportunity to hear other people's stories. You know, as I said, at church, you don't really get that chance, do you? To really delve in and understand what makes someone tick, what they've been through. And it helps you just sort of understand them a little better and to see them more or to, you know, have some compassion when you hear some of the difficulties or, or, to, or to rejoice with them in the transformation or in the healing that God has done in their life. And that has been really precious. And I would not have found that out just by having church every week. It's just very unlikely. And so connect groups are a way to really sort of meet each other and, and get to know each other at that second level. Who here remembers the show Cheers? Probably only those over about 40. Yeah, good on you. <laughs> but, you know, that, the song about Cheers, you know, it just simply says that you go where everybody knows your name. And there's something about that, isn't there? You know, who's ever walked into a, a, a cafe? Maybe you've been there once or twice, and the second time you go back or the third time you go back, they go, oh, you're a latte with one sugar, right? Who's had that experience? And what does it make you feel like? It makes you feel good. Are you going to, go to going to go back to that cafe or are you going to go to somewhere where they don't know you? You are more likely to go back where someone has taken a little bit of notice of you and just said, hey, isn't this what you like? And so that's what church needs to be like. That's where connect groups can really lift us up in that area and say, hey, last week you said pray for this situation. How's that going? And at church it's just... You know, boom, 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 sort of quick, 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 quick. Occasionally you might get to sit, time to sit down. But connect groups is really where you go to that second level where everybody knows your name and everybody can start to, to come around you and support you and you can share what is happening in your life rather than emailing the office and hoping and praying that Pastor Reg or Pastor Leanne will hear about my issue. You know? You can try that route, but it, it's, you know, it's a lot harder, isn't it, to, to sometimes get our attention. And God never intended for it to all be through one or two people. You know, it was always, we are the ministers of reconciliation, the Bible says. Not just the pastors and the leaders, but we all have that ability. And so God, you know, says, share your burdens with one another and, and connect at that level. And so the last point I want to make on this slide is that there is power in small numbers. And this is an extraordinary scripture where it says in Leviticus 26 verse 8, five of you will chase a hundred and a hundred of you shall put 10,000 to flight. Is that not power in the small numbers? You know, there's another scripture in Romans that says, if God is for you, who can be against you? And I know sometimes that takes a lot of courage and a lot of faith when you feel like the whole world is against you or the system is against you, whatever it is. But God says, you, five of you are together, you will chase that 100 away. That's the power that he gives us. That's the authority he gives us. And so in a small group, imagine if five people are praying against some demonic activity or, against, or are praying for people like our prime minister. There is power in that, guys. And it doesn't matter what polls say and it doesn't matter what's happening because it's all happening in the supernatural. And we are activating the angels to go do the work of God. Did you realise that? That's something that you and I get to do is to partner with them in seeing the gospel preached and things changed in this nation. So that's what, something that you know, God does for us. But I want to come down to now to a very specific situation with living faith itself is that it has been a directive from God for some time now to look at connect groups, that he wanted to work through them. And so I just want to remind us of our prophetic words that were released over the past three years. And uh, if I could kindly have that uh, up on the screen, it's to, 
you know, he's spoken to us about establishing connect groups and what he wants to do through them. So in 2017, he said there'll be more connect groups planted this year and there were a few more that were done that year and they became an oasis of healing. And we did start to hear that, that people were, were getting emotional healing and breakthrough and physical healings in those connect groups. In 2018, again, he said new connect groups are going to be happening. We'll be putting a, a tent on the church premises, which is exactly why we've got the, the white tent up on the, the deck there. That was the place that God said to the connect leaders will stand and, and sign people up. And, and so they're out there again today. I think Sonny and Sue Sonny are up there today. They're assigned to, to, take, to just share with you, let you know what connect groups are around and, and who you can start to get established uh, with. But also, maybe it's on your heart to start a connect group. And so if you want to prayerfully take that to the Lord and see if that's something you should do. But 2019, he says, connect groups are going to double in size in each home that they run. And that definitely has happened in ours. I know Sue and Anthony, uh, that's happened in theirs. Uh, I think even towards last year, it was starting to, to really increase. And so, you know, God has said more people were going to be in those areas. And then we're going to do all-night prayer meetings and I believe Sue and Anthony and some of the other Connect leaders have already had theirs. We haven't been able to do ours yet. Ours is coming up in a couple of weeks. Uh, so, you know, we're going to have that time. And we're expecting Holy Spirit to birth a greater awakening. That's what he says is going to happen in the home settings. And so if some of us, if we're not connected in, then how is that going to happen, guys? How are you going to experience that? Because that's what God wants to do is through those small groups, that there is power in that small group. And due to that intercession, due to our prayer time, the fellowship here is going to become united, close and powerful. Those were the three words that God released. And I don't know about you, but that sounds pretty cool to me. You know, that we want to get on board with that and, and see all of those things come to pass. And that's, that's, you know, so it is a directive that God has given this church specifically. And so the last point, or the last couple of points I want to make is, you know, as I said to you earlier, the church is our extended family. You know, we all have brothers and sisters, fathers and mothers in the natural, but we are an extended family here. And we are to love each other as brothers and sisters in Christ. And, you know, there's a care in my heart for every single person in this room, whether I know you or not. You are a brother or sister in Christ, and there is a, a natural love and compassion and desire to, to see all that God has for you in your life come to pass. Ephesians 2.19 says, Now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but you are fellow citizens with the saints. Guess what? You're a saint today, guys. You may not feel it. You may not act like it all the time. I know my halo slips occasionally. But apparently you are saints. Saints and members of the household of God. This is God's household. And we get to sit in it. We get to connect with each other. We, need to, we get to go deeper and walk with each other. And 1 Corinthians 12 says, If one member suffers, then all of us suffer. And if one member is honoured, all the members rejoice with it. That's how the body of Christ works. It's like, wow, did that happen to you in your life? Let's cheer that person on. You know, we're not sitting there going, Oh, I wish that had happened to me. You know, that, that's not where we're at, guys. We're actually cheering that person on. Or if they're going through a hard time, I'm really sorry to hear that. What can we do? Do you need any physical needs met? Do you need emotional, spiritual, mental needs met? What can we do to walk alongside you? Do we do it perfectly? No, we don't, guys. And I know from time to time people feel a little bit let down by the church and feel that we might have missed something. And, you know, and it's... It always grieves my heart when I hear that happen because it's never our intention. But, you know, as I said to you, when, when the load is, is sort of spread across all connect groups, instead of ringing the office and saying, hey, I have a need, guess who you can call? The, the 10 or other, so other people in your connect group and just say, hey, can you guys pray for me? Hold me up in this area. And that's the power and the beauty of being a part of the small groups, which as we saw, a biblical, as much as the corporate is here, we should, you know, God says, don't stop coming to the corporate, the word says. Do not forsake the fellowship. But there's power in that small group to, to go that next level and really find out what's happening in people's lives. And so the final point here this morning is that they are an avenue whereby God wants to touch, heal, and bring his presence in a greater way. 
And that's our heart, is to see all of you enjoy that word that he has released through connect groups. Matthew 18 verse 20 simply says, where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there in the midst of them. Who wants to be a part of that? Who wants to know that Jesus is there when you're meeting in his name? Can I ask the team to come back up on the stage? Thank you. You know, I really hope and pray that I've been able to sow something in your spirit here this morning about the importance of, of being a part of a connect group, how you can be blessed, how you can bless others and support others to be able to be, you know, a part of this extended family. We don't want anyone to come in here and just say, you know, kind of sit on the outer. We want you to feel that you are connected in. And I, I kindly ask, don't necessarily wait for an invitation because people get busy, people can overlook things. Let's all, you know, take the opportunity to say, hey, can I just talk to you? What connect groups are available for me? What's nearby to me? Maybe it's the genre you want to go with, you know, young adults or uh, older people, whatever it is, we're trying to cater to them all. And as I said, if you have a heart, though, to even lead a connect group, do let us know. Amen? Amen. All right, thank you, guys. And I'll give it to the team to take away. Thank you. you are faithful and you're true. Through your mercy I'm made new. I will be still and know that you are God. You're my refuge and my strength. My redeemer and my friend with all my heart I trust in you You are faithful and you're true Through your mercy I'm made new I will be still And know that you are God You're my refuge and my strength my Redeemer and my friend With all my heart I try